with me right here on VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn, Anna Mateo, and John Russell. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Brian Lynn. Facebook suffered a major outage Monday that blocked the company's 3.5 billion users from its social media and messaging services. The company blamed the nearly six-hour outage on problems related to a configuration change made by its engineers. The outage affected Facebook's main services as well as the company's Instagram and WhatsApp products. The service outage was the largest ever recorded by the company Down Detector, an online internet website tracker. Facebook said there was no evidence the outage was the result of an internet attack, and it appeared that no user data was endangered. It apologized to its users and said it was working to understand more about the cause. Several Facebook employees who wanted to remain anonymous spoke to Reuters news agency about the outage. They said they believed it was caused by a mistake inside an area of the company that controls how Internet traffic is routed to its systems. The outage came one day after a former employee went public with her identity after providing secret documents about the company to the Wall Street Journal. The former data scientist, Frances Haugen, appeared Sunday night on the CBS television program, 60 Minutes. The documents Haugen provided suggested that Facebook's own research had shown how the company's products and decisions can be harmful to users. Haugen also reached out anonymously to federal law enforcement to investigate Facebook. She provided company documents that she said showed how Facebook magnifies hate and misinformation and fuels political division. Haugen says Facebook has been dishonest in its public declarations about its efforts to fight hate speech and misinformation. The documents also showed that the company was aware that Instagram can harm the mental health of girls and young women. On Tuesday, Haugen discussed her criticisms of Facebook in front of the United States Senate Commerce Subcommittee on Consumer Protection. In her testimony, she accused Facebook's leaders of failing to make changes based on the research because they chose to put company profits above the safety of users. In written testimony provided to the Senate group, Haugen said Facebook's leadership knows how to make Facebook and Instagram safer but won't make the necessary changes because they have put their astronomical profits before people. I'm Brian Lynn.
Leaf peeping is a beloved yearly activity in many parts of the world, including parts of the United States. The northeastern and mid-Atlantic states are especially popular for beautiful fall colors. Leaf peeping is when people travel to see the beautiful colors of fall foliage. Foliage is another name for leaves, and fall is another word for autumn. However, recent fall leaf peeping seasons have been changed by weather conditions. A lack of rain causes leaves to turn brown and die before they can reach the best color. Heat waves cause leaves to fall before autumn even arrives. And extreme weather events, like hurricanes, take the leaves off trees altogether. Climate change also creates longer-term threats that could harm leaf peeping. The spread of diseases and insects is also tied to warming temperatures. These are all affecting autumn's famous fall colors. Scientists say that this is likely to continue as the planet warms. Some of the scientists recently spoke with the Associated Press. Typically, by the end of September, some leaves turn colors throughout the U.S. However, this year, trees in many areas are still green. For example, in northern Maine, the best time for leaf colors usually happens in late September. But on September 29th, Maine forest officials had reported less than 70% color change of the leaves and only moderate leaf drop. Across the country in Denver, Colorado, high temperatures have left dead dry edges of leaves early in the season, said Michael Sundberg. He is a tree expert in the area. Sundberg told the AP that instead of slow change, trees are affected by abnormal weather. They change all of a sudden, or they drop leaves early, Sundberg said. It's been a few years since we've had a really good leaf year. The reason climate change can be bad for fall leaves has to do with plant biology. When fall arrives, days lengthen and temperatures drop. The chlorophyll in a leaf breaks down, and that causes the leaf to lose its green color. The green leaf turns into a beautiful yellow, red, or orange autumn leaf. Getting those beautiful colors requires a balance, said Paul Schauberg. He is a research plant physiologist with the U.S. Forest Service, based in Burlington, Vermont. Warm fall temperatures, he said, can cause leaves to remain green longer. Worse than that, Schauberg said, very dry summers can stress trees and cause their leaves to miss the fall colors completely. A 2003 study in the journal Tree Physiology that Schauberg co-wrote stated that environmental stress can speed up leaf decay. He said in severe droughts, trees experience difficulty. That is happening already. This summer's heat wave in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. led to a condition called foliage scorch. Foliage scorch is when leaves brown too early, explained Chris Still. He is a professor at the Forest Ecosystems and Society Department at Oregon State University. In some parts of Oregon, leaves lost their color early and then quickly fell to the ground. 
This led to a shorter and less beautiful leaf peeping season. I'm Ana Mateo. In many countries, children have been going to school for more than a month. So far, Fears the Delta coronavirus variant would prevent in-person learning have largely proved unfounded. In 12 countries with high vaccination rates in Asia, Europe, and the United States, case rates increased in August. Now they have mostly fallen back, according to local data and officials. It is unclear how much the decrease is due to a worldwide decline in cases and how much it is linked to vaccinations and other measures. Public health experts say they will continue to watch for signs of an increase in cases as winter nears. Monica Gandhi is a professor of medicine at University of California San Francisco Medical School. In the United States, in-school transmission is higher in places with low adult vaccination and no mitigation. But, overall, schools have stayed open, Gandhi said. Gandhi described the situation in schools as going better than expected. Cases among children increased by nearly seven times in August. They reached their high in the first week of September, American Academy of Pediatrics data shows. Only about 2% of U.S. schools have closed temporarily because of COVID-19 outbreaks. That information comes from research company Burbio. Children represent the largest group of the unvaccinated in most wealthy countries. That is because either vaccinations for their age group have only just begun or are not yet approved. Public health experts suggest rising vaccinations, mitigation measures in schools, and a broader decrease in community cases are helping. Not all countries have seen a decrease in cases. In Singapore, Cases among children have been on the rise for all of September, but in Scandinavia, Scotland, Germany, France, South Korea, and the United States, cases are falling. Earlier, there were fears the Delta variant would drive up infections. In Sweden, schools have largely remained open throughout the coronavirus crisis. The country saw a rise in COVID-19 infections among children after the summer holidays. But cases are now at low levels, both among children and the wider population. In Norway, cases increased to a daily record of 1,785 after the first two weeks of school, before falling by 60% as of last week. Preben Avetsland is a senior doctor at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. We do expect the current downward trend to continue for a few weeks and then level off at a low level, at least for a couple of months, Avetsland told Reuters by email. He added, Then there are uncertainties about the winter season. Britain has seen some increase in cases in schools that opened early on, but it has not spread to the wider population, said Neil Ferguson of the Imperial College London. In Scotland, schools reopened in mid-August, and COVID cases increased to record numbers by the end of the month. Now, however, cases among the under-19 have fallen each week since the first week of September. While cases began rising in Scotland before schools opened, some level of transmission appears to be happening in schools. It's very hard to separate community transmission that is related to schools to transmission in schools. 
However, clusters of cases in single classrooms do not appear to be particularly high, suggesting that it is at least a mix of both, Roland Cow wrote to Reuters by email. I'm John Russell. From VOA Learning English, welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember in Washington. We have been talking about the Compromise of 1850. In September of that year, the United States Congress passed five bills that sought to settle the issue of slavery. All five became law after the president signed them. Yes, I love your body. No evil have I done. Owning another human being was legal in many parts of the U.S. at that time. Most American slaves or their ancestors originally came from Africa. Many slaves worked for white landowners in cotton or tobacco fields. Some, like Phoebe Boyd of Virginia, worked in the family's home. Had to clean up and set the table. That recording comes from the Voices from the Days of Slavery project at the U.S. Library of Congress. Ms. Boyd was speaking in 1935, remembering her childhood as a slave. She said she had to clean up, set the table, carry the food, and afterwards prepare the bed. Harriet Smith of Texas was another former slave. She said in a 1941 recording that she did not go to school. Aunt Harriet, as she was called, said she did not know anything about reading or writing. She said she was taught only to obey the slave owners. Slaves were considered property, like farm animals or furniture. Slave owners could do anything they wanted with their slaves, including separate them from their families, sexually abuse them, hurt, or even kill them. Harriet Smith said her owners treated her well, but she heard about slaves who were mistreated. Yes, I know of times they mistreated people they did, and I hear our folks talking you know, about them hooping, you know, so they had to grease the back to take the clothes from the, the back. Some slaves were beaten so badly, she said, they had to repair the holes in their backs with grease. By 1804, all northern states had banned slavery. But northern whites still did not accept blacks as their equals. And slavery was still legal in southern states for more than half of the 19th century. Slave owners there said they needed slaves to work on large farms or for other economic reasons. But other Americans said slavery was immoral or that it gave the South the unfair competitive edge of low-cost labor. The Compromise of 1850 attempted to balance the desires of those who supported and those who opposed slavery. Politicians were not the only ones who struggled with the issue of slavery in the United States. Slaves, for example, had been fighting the system for some time. Many slaves resisted their owners in small ways. They broke or hid tools, or they worked slowly or claimed to be sick even when they were not. A few answered the violence of slavery with violence. They planned 
but rarely succeeded to kill their masters and escape. A man named Nat Turner led one of the best-known slave rebellions. Turner was born in 1800 in the slave state of Virginia. Unlike most slaves, he could read. He also believed that God had given him a special purpose. In 1831, Turner saw what he described as a sign from above. The sign told him it was time to rebel against slavery. He gathered several men and in the middle of the night killed his master and his master's family in their beds. Turner and his men continued to another house and then another. They killed every white person they found. Other slaves saw what was happening and joined Turner. By the end of the raids, 40 blacks had stabbed, beaten, or shot to death an estimated 55 whites. A local white militia moved to stop Turner and his group. Almost all the attackers were captured quickly. Some were killed, others were sold and sent away from their families. But Nat Turner escaped capture. For a month, he hid around his master's farm. Finally, someone found him. Turner was jailed, tried, sentenced, and hanged. After he died, his killers pulled off his skin and removed his head. The historian Henry Louis Gates, Jr., studied Nat Turner's slave rebellion. He wrote that blacks remembered Turner for his personal war against slavery, his violent methods, and his harsh treatment after death. But whites had a different reaction. Frightened white mobs killed another 200 blacks to answer the rebellion. Most of these blacks had no part in the rebellion. After Nat Turner's rebellion, the state of Virginia passed stronger laws to control slaves. The legislation included bans on reading, gathering, and traveling. Even with stronger laws in place, many slaves continued taking huge risks in an effort to win their freedom. From about the end of the 1700s to the middle of the 1800s, thousands escaped slavery on what came to be called the Underground Railroad. When the sun comes back and the first quail calls The Underground Railroad was not a real railroad. It was a group of people, both blacks and whites, who secretly helped slaves escape to the north. Follow the drinking Members of the Underground Railroad helped slaves leave the places where they lived and worked. These conductors took the escaping slaves to a safe house or business called a station. Station masters hid the escaped slave. Then, at night, a different conductor took him or her to another hiding place farther north. The process was repeated every day and night until the escaped slave was safe in a free state or even in Canada. A black woman named Harriet Tubman was perhaps the most famous conductor on the Underground Railroad. She had been born a slave around 1820. She worked first in a house and then in the fields for an owner in the slave state of Maryland. Harriet Tubman was known for her bravery. 
One story people told about her happened when she was a teenage girl. An overseer, someone who controlled the slaves in the field, became angry with another slave. He threatened the man with a heavy weight. Young Harriet stepped between the overseer and the other slave. The overseer threw the weight. It hit her in the head. For the rest of her life, Harriet Tubman suffered from the injury. It caused headaches, strange dreams, and from time to time made her fall deeply asleep. When Tubman was about 29, she suspected her owner would sell her, so she decided to escape instead. One night, she secretly walked away. She walked over 200 kilometers following the North Star. Eventually, she arrived in the city of Philadelphia in the free state of Pennsylvania. A year later, Tubman returned to Maryland. She helped her sister and her sister's children escape. Then she helped her brother and two other men. She helped her parents, who were over 70 years old, and she helped many others. In all, Tubman made as many as 19 trips to the South. She led about 300 slaves to freedom. Tubman and her passengers were never caught, but if they had been, they would have been severely punished. Former masters were likely to beat or cut off the hands of escaped slaves. The Compromise of 1850 made escaping slavery even harder. One of the bills Congress passed was the Fugitive Slave Act. It said anyone who helped a fugitive, that is, an escaped slave, would be fined. And it said fugitive slaves must be returned to their owner even if they had escaped to a free state. Fugitive slaves had no right to a trial. Because they could not defend themselves in court, even freed blacks could be kidnapped and enslaved. In 1852, a white woman published a book about slavery. She called it Uncle Tom's Cabin. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote the book for one reason. She wanted to show how cruel slavery was. Fugitive slaves also published books about their experiences. The stories painted a picture of slavery that most people in the North had never seen. They were shocked. Public pressure to end slavery grew stronger. Anti-slavery activists, called abolitionists, wanted to free all slaves immediately. But even if that could be done, there was the question of what to do with the freed slaves. In many places, it seemed impossible that blacks and whites could live together peacefully and in freedom. The best answer, some people thought, was to free the slaves and help them return to Africa. It was not a new idea. In the early 1800s, a group of leading Americans had formed an organization for that purpose. They called it the American Colonization Society. In 1820, the society began helping to send blacks to Africa. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.